I, I know you guys are both getting the same thing, but it's so, it's so great to hear all of the participants on here saying how, what a blessing this is, uh, taking their mind off of the worriness. Uh, last night I was speaking to my wife and we were really talking about, hey, there's a lot of people that still don't understand how crucial this is. And we're learning from these experts about aerosols, about how to clean up. Uh, yeah. We need to be the leaders yeah. in our yeah. communities of saying, hey, we are, this is why we're doing this. We want to get rid of this bell curve. But there, thanks for everybody for being here. Yeah, and absolutely. Everybody in the Facebook group, uh, for the people monitoring Facebook, but posting, uh, you know, even all the questions on unemployment, the links in the states, the documents, every, like, it's crazy. And I really appreciate you guys doing that. So, again, go to the Facebook group. All the documents that are being listed, we're just, we're working as fast as we can just to post them right there. Um, we do have a lot of next week, if not all of next week, already booked. I don't know what that looks like. And so um, as of one o'clock after the hour, we're going to start working on the week after that. And again, I don't know what that looks like. But um, shout out to our team again. I uh, mean, shout out to everybody between Dental Intel and Act Dental. Um, we have been literally into the evening hours and 1130 at night and for Curtis and his team, Good they're morning. waking up uh, extremely early, um, you know, to join us and broadcast. Uh, the other morning, Curtis and I ate breakfast together and I was reminded that Curtis was like two hours before me. So I was just eating breakfast and you were eating it too. So um, just in a constant reminder, you guys have been, everybody's been so generous. Um, and Leanne is asking to jump on Curtis. So yeah, everybody's good. been so generous with their comments and feedback to us. And I, and I share it right back to you guys. I mean, yeah, we thank a, you guys for showing up. Speaking of generous and rock stars, mm -hmm. this is the perfect segue. I call her the female, and it's not even fair to call you a female rock star. You're just a rock star now, and oh my I watched God. you do what you do. The first time I saw you, I'm like, she's brilliant, and I have so many Leanne-isms. Um, I get them from this Leanne that's right here, and then I get them from this Leanne right here. Um, there are things that you say, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's genius. Like, and But so, do I get a t-shirt? I want to know if Josh Austin is going to do a t-shirt for Josh me. Josh Austin is making <laughs> a brand new business. He is making a lemonade out of lemons right now. It's called the dental t-shirt quote business. And I think you're the second person. I don't know. I know. I mean, I, I actually want one of those Bill Robbins t-shirts. So I'm going to have to like email Josh or text Josh and say, wait a minute, put my name at the front of the line because I'm guessing he's already got too much inventory request. Yeah. Okay. Let me introduce you. Be making you a shirt. Don't worry. Yeah. Let me introduce you and the incredible organization you lead. I just have to say this. Um, when I got started in this business, one of my first assignments, I I didn't even know what I was doing, but one of my mentors said, you're going to go to the Panky Institute and you're going to go learn. And I'm like, where is that? And so I, I flew down there and I'm like, why am I going here? Erwin Becker and Clayton Davis for, I was, it was called C1 back then. And I slept with Clayton, not, I didn't sleep with Clayton. I slept in the, in the, in the uh, condo and I, I learned so much as a 25 year old kid, I'm like, Oh my gosh. And it changed my life. And, um, those people to this day, Frank Graziano, all those mentors, Mike Fling, uh, your, uh, Erwin Becker, like just unbelievable people come in and out of your life as a result of that. And to watch you lead this organization when you, I'm like, of course, of course you would have Lee do that. And so that's a, a little bit about the pinky and soup, but then also Lee, you're just an incredible educator. You're so smart. You're so, you're so powerful. Um, we just love you. And so thank you for jumping on today. And if people don't know who you are or the pinky Institute, just because you got 2000 people watching, some people might not know who you are. Just go there first. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. I think a great big shout out to all of you for putting this together. I don't think any organization jumped on this as fast as you all did and got this going. Um, you know, and I think we all have way too many other things to think about. This is a really nice way to use all this excess time um, and to just put your brain on something that's a little less stressful. So thank you to Dental Intel and to ACT. And I don't know whose brainchild this was, but whoever it was gets kudos for being ahead of the creative curve of everybody else. So way to go. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, um, 
you know, one of the things that you said, uh, which to me is my mantra is what does the Panky Institute do? We change lives and we've been doing it for 51 years and we will continue to do that. Um, one of the gifts is not um, just exquisite clinical education. It really is community. And, you know, one of the things that I have loved watching, we use WhatsApp um, to communicate with our classes. So we set up a new WhatsApp group every time we have a group coming into the building. And I'm in a lot of them. Thank God I'm not in all of them, but I'm in a lot of them. Um, and they have been on fire this last week. Um, and that ability to connect and have community and get other people's opinions and, and, you know, just to say, you know, what are you guys doing? You know, what do you think about this? What are you hearing in your state? Um, and that's phenomenal. I know you guys are doing that on Facebook also. And, and we need to take advantage of all of those resources in our community. But yeah, finding the Institute is easy. It's just panky, P-A-N-K-E-Y dot O-R-G. Uh, we also have a really phenomenal um, blog website that we call Panky Graham. So it's just pankygram.org. Lots and lots of content there. Um, and we're going to, we have a really great YouTube presence. So also if you're just, you know, looking for stuff and you just, you know, have nothing else that's on your plate and you want to watch some really great clinical videos or non-clinical videos. So great stuff from Mary Osborne, Bill Gregg, people just about, you know, patient communications, any of that, lots of resources to do all of that. So thank you for that. Um, and then I will put a plug in for Restorative Nation if people are looking for online content. So restorativenation.com is where I post all of my educational videos, uh, two minutes to a couple of hours if you're looking for stuff to do over the next and couple of weeks. Say, they are excellent. So mm -hmm. yes. Well, thank you. So um, yeah, but this is, you know, these are unprecedented times. And, and I, yeah. I, I'm actually really proud of dentistry. I have to say, yeah. I am really proud of all of us as a profession. Yeah. Take us through this. I want you to, to, uh, to open that up, but then also what's the last seven days of your life? What'd you say to your faculty at Panky? Would you just take us through the life, what you've been through? Oh, well, I mean, as everybody I'm sure has said, and you all have experienced, um, if things are changing so quickly that like moment to moment, you're making different decisions. Um, you know, a week ago today, I was in Key Biscayne, I was at the Institute and we were um, hosting a group of Essentials One participants, 17 people who uh, got on a plane last week in the face of, you know, that uncertainty seven days ago and came down to the Institute to start their Panky journey. And, you know, it's interesting because when you're at the Institute and you know this because you've been there, you are kind of in a little bubble, right? You're not at home with your family, your team. Um, it's a pretty special environment on Key Biscayne. So in some ways, we were pretty insulated for a couple of days. And truthfully, we didn't start having conversations about what was happening and almost until like the last day. Because you, you would have thought if you were in the building, it was an E1 like any other E1 we've ever done. Um, so, but, you know, that decision a couple of days before that to have that class run in the face of what we knew 10 days ago, and then literally on the last day of that class, I made the decision to shut the Institute down for a month. And so we were really busy starting the process of contacting everybody that was supposed to be in this week and next week. And, you know, and just saying, you know, the best thing is to not take any risks and to let people stay home and let people deal with what's going on on the home front. And, and, you know, we can, we can make that easier for everybody um, and then of course, you know, I had to fly home on Sunday. So, you know, getting on an airplane, you know, at Miami International on Sunday. And, you know, I was actually kind of surprised. I actually thought there'd be fewer people there than there were, and that there might be more people like wearing masks. I, I was as crowded as ever. And I'd probably say it was probably about 40% eh, of people were wearing a mask or doing something. So I, I was actually kind of surprised by that. Um, and, you know, at the same time, Sunday, we were hearing all of the chatter about shutting down dental practices. And, you know, one of the things for me is I know dentists in every state in the union. I know dentists in most countries. And so I'm getting texts from people, you know, Michigan is doing this, Ohio is doing this, Canada is doing this. So, you know, I'm kind of staying on top of it outside Arizona. Arizona sort of was behind a lot of the other states. But I already knew on that plane coming home Sunday that I was going to have to dramatically change my practice Monday morning. 
so really before we'd even really announced anything in Arizona, Monday morning, I went in and said, we're shutting down hygiene. We're taking everybody's temperature. We're rinsing with hydrogen peroxide. And that was like 8 a.m. And by five o'clock, I was like, yep, we're shutting down. We're not only seeing emergency patients. So, I mean, that was kind of our week. We pretty much shut the practice down by about midday on Monday. And I've been in to see a couple emergency patients since then. But like everyone else, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to help my team and support my team and keep things going. And I've got two teams. I've got my dental practice team and I've got my Panky team. You know, Miami-Dade uh, just shut the whole city down. So the mayor of Miami-Dade um, came out yesterday and shut down the entire thing. So all businesses are closed. Everything is closed except for essentials. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's a moving target of, um, you know, What's, what's happening now? What are we changing now? And like everybody else at the same time going, I, I need to get to the grocery store. I need to, right? I need to, you know, but one of the things I have to tell you, so I'm vegetarian and I almost am vegan. Like I, I verge on being vegan when I'm home in my house. And the great news about that dietary preference right now is our food is the last stuff to disappear off the grocery stores. <laughs> That's fascinating. What, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say as a country, as a culture? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I was really impressed that like, if you want tofu, that's way easier to find than chicken and steak and, you know, gluten-free pasta. Like that's the first thing I reach for. And it's what's left now because everybody else sees it as a food of last res resource. <laughs> right. Very interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, yeah. this is this is your this is your show. Like, you lead us. Where do you want to go? Like, I, some people want to do clinical practice. Some people want to have a conversation. I want to do whatever you want to do, and we got your back. Yeah, you know, and I mean, and I think maybe it's sort of a it's a combination of things. You know, I actually have been watching a little bit today, um, and so I've watched uh, you know what other people have been doing. I guess you know, for me, one of the things that I think is maybe the hottest topic for folks practicing dentistry right now and um, planning ahead is thinking about what it's going to look like when we pick the pieces back up. Right? Okay. And yeah. unfortunately um, we have a recent example of having to go through something not quite this dramatic, but similar. And that's of course, 2008 and 2009 and the economic crisis, you know, and thinking through how we're going to do that. And like probably the biggest lesson I learned in that is bread and butter dentistry is, is going to be the backbone of this. And once we are all back in our practices, we're not only having to deal with the fallout from being closed for however many weeks this goes on to, but we're going to have to deal with the fallout of the fact that people have been economically stressed, you know, and a lot of dentistry is considered a discretionary expense and so I go to, hey, what happened in 2008 and 2009? And what I know is, um, you know, having a strong hygiene department, um, having a strong uh, base of patients who just need operative dentistry, some basic fixed, you know, people who still want to just maintain the health of their mouth as best as possible is the, is the place that will get us through, will carry us through. And, you know, the discretionary things like the cosmetic cases and the rest, you know, the rehabilitations, that'll come back. But it's going to lag people's interest in just being health conscious and taking care of their health. And, and we may be doing it differently. I have, a, I have a feeling that I'll be taking people's temperatures, not just right during the crisis, but after. I actually had a young lady in my office last week on that Monday that I told you about where we're shutting things down. And she actually was having some pain. I needed to get her in the office, get her in the office and took her temperature and she had a fever and she didn't know it. Oh my. So what'd you do? Uh, you know what? We basically referred her right back to her healthcare provider and told her that we, unfortunately we can't see her because, you know, hopefully cross your fingers. It's just the good old ordinary flu, which I never thought I would say, yay, let's get the real oh, flu. <laughs> right. I'm um, right. But um, you know, and then obviously it was good because we had the ability to not treat her and to help her get to her healthcare provider, but then take that disinfection piece for the operatory. I think we'll be doing that for a long time. I think we'll be having patients do preoperative rinses for a long time. Um, but that's to allow us to do just our regular dentistry. 
you know? And so thinking about um, that part of my practice is gonna be the part of my practice that I can go back and that will start back up and that I can depend on and that the other stuff will lag behind it, but it will come back just like it did in 2009 and 2010. So what, what thermometer are you using? I'm sorry. What thermometer or gut like sensor are you using for fevers? Um, you know what? I'm using whatever I could buy on the internet at the time because <laughs> that was a pretty hard thing to get a hold of. Um, you know, fortunately, I was able to get um, two infrared um, thermometers that read with forehead, so you don't have to touch anybody. Um, and I think they're from Braun, B R A U N. They're just kind of over, you know, over the counter, but it was a scramble. Again, I felt pretty fortunate with the fact that because I was getting updates from people all across the nation, I knew about some of this stuff before it really hit other people. Um, and so I could get on and order that. But, you know, a lot of people have these in their homes. If you do have an ear thermometer, it's better, obviously, than an intraoral thermometer. Um, and if you've got the kind that will not, you don't even have to touch anybody, that's that kind of the best of all processes right now. Um, I actually did a whole bunch of research just to learn that the kind we all keep in our kitchens don't work on human beings. Um, so you can't use the one, the infrareds that'll do like a pan in your kitchen. You actually need one that's um, regulated for human body temperature. Uh, but, it, you know, it's actually been, um, it's been interesting to me that when I went on to order stuff like hydrogen peroxide and a thermometer um, even a week ago, and everything was saying, you know, sold out or out of stock or delayed delivery. Yet I now I am actually getting deliveries of things. Okay. And, yeah, and right. And so yeah. I kind of, I, yeah, I kind of think one of the things we have to realize is I think we've slowed down the su supply chain, but we haven't stopped the supply chain. Right. Right. You know, you may not be able to walk to CVS and buy a thermometer right now, but you can certainly order one from walmart.com or whoever, and you might wait a week, but you'll have it. Right. And, you know, and we'll have it for when we go back, but yeah. So, I mean, so that's the piece for me where I'm, I'm paying attention is even thinking about what can I learn right now about composites and about single unit restorations, you know, how can I hit the ground running to do that stuff, which is going to be the bread and butter. What are we doing about hygiene so that we're ready to go? Let's go and, there. I love you know, it. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so, oh, and see, we have people posting about thermometers. I love this. See, this is what I love about community is that, you know, that we can, we can help each other and we can support each other with all of this. Um, you know, that, you know, for me, kind of the backbone of my practice has always been day-to-day -day operative dentistry and my hygiene department. And that's always the piece of my um, when I look at my p and and I evaluate my practice every month, that's the backbone of what I know um, I can just depend on, right? And, you know, other things ebb and flow. And, you know, we know they ebb and flow for lots of reasons. They ebb and flow based on my presence in the office. How am I doing with treatment planning? How am I doing with case presenting? I've learned over the years that that's always a sine wave. It goes up and it goes down. And what I've just decided is I'm the most critical factor in that sine wave. And when I'm really busy, because all the people I treatment planned a month or two ago are coming in and having dentistry, I'm really less good at treatment planning and case presentation. And then when it slows down, I get to turn my focus to treatment planning and case presentation, and then it gets busy again. Um, I wish I could tell you I had a magic wand that taught myself how to level out that those ups and downs. Um, but I don't because it really is just about focus. It really is about being able to be present. And so I look at the next whatever period of time, I hate to give a time frame to it, because that's one of the things we're all doing to each other is saying two weeks or six months and, you know, and creating some of that, that we don't know, right. is one of the great things about going back to my office, if my office is slower, is that I'll have more time and when I have more time, I am way more effective about building relationships with my patients, about having conversations, about doing comprehensive treatment planning, like Bill Robbins was just talking about, um, and about helping patients move forward with their dentistry. And what I may have to simply do is be much more focused on helping them phase their dentistry 
and, and we'll do the dentistry. We just might do it over a longer time period, or I might have to help them get some, um, you know, what we used to call phase one dentistry in dental school, you know, so let's take care of the perio issues. Let's take care of the caries, anything like that. But then know that I'm still thinking comprehensively. I'm still comprehensively treatment planning them so that a year from now or less when the economy recovers, let's hope we're right, it's a V-shaped recession. Um, I've already got done that treatment planning, yeah. right? It, this isn't the time to start thinking short-term. It actually is the time to say, let's continue to think long-term and then take our long-term plan and come back and say, What's the short-term way I can help this person? What's the short-term way that I can be with this patient, helping them continue to work on their, on their dental health and making sure everything is maintained? For yeah. sure. I love it. I love it. I do too. Yeah. yeah. That's so, really cool because like right now you can really gear up on what are your systems for hygiene? We talked about that a lot yesterday. What are your systems going to be like in order to, because I don't, we don't want to do sh uh, fast work for bread and butter, but we do want to be efficient, right? The more efficient you can be. And if you're getting those systems down so that it's like, all right, this op is just for uh, filling uh, amalgams, right? right? This op is just for crowns. This op, and if you're able to, I, I'm just saying right now, getting ready for the start back up. If we get these systems ready in place, we'll be able to do great work for people who haven't been brushing their teeth or who haven't uh, been, who need the dental work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, like, so one of the things I think about that I, you know, I just know when I, I'll use a terminology that I got from my good friend, Mary Osborne, and she talks a lot about what we call lost opportunities. And there's always a ton of lost opportunities in my practice. And as I said, there's more of them when, when we're busy. The truth is we actually tend to get less efficient and less effective when the office is just cranking. Mm -hmm. And it's these opportunities where you're going to have a little bit more time and you can slow down and you can focus that you can say, what are those lost opportunities? And so I'll give you a classic one out of hygiene is FMXs, full mouth series x-rays. Mm -hmm. Patients get in our practice, they come in and we do whatever we call a comp exam and the x-rays that go with a comp exam. In my office, a large percentage of the time, that's a full mouth series of x-rays. Different people have different processes, pano and bite wings, whatever your process is. And then once they're in the recall system, we just do bite wings. And so whatever that is, every 12 months, every 18 months, whatever your process is, it's bite wings, bite wings, bite wings, bite wings. So what is your system for going back and taking patients of record and saying, we need to do a comp exam. It's been long enough. Mm -hmm. We actually need to schedule you back with the doctor and we need to go back and do everything and look at everything as if you were a new patient. Mm -hmm. And we need to do the radiographs that accompany that. Yeah. Right. I, I think what you're saying is because I don't know where, I don't know if it's LD or Lauren Miller. One, one of them said this, you probably have a practice within your practice. Do you know what I mean? Like probably two practices within your practice. But the question is, it's not about the dentistry. It's about a standard of care, you know, and you look at standards of cares, even with certain protocols for other health, you know, how often right. should, should a woman go for a mammogram? You don't just say whenever there's right. certain protocols that keep people healthy. And I think what you're talking about is established. This is a great opportunity to, to get to Cal, you call it, uh, Leanne Fate calls it, you know, clinical calibration with your team, just like right. let's all get on the same page about what we're trying to do here. It's brilliant, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, just lots of those opportunities. But, you know, with that, I'll sort of spin this into kind of sort of our stated topic a little bit is, you know, single unit posterior restorations for me are also part of the bread and butter in my practice. You know, I have lots and lots of patients in my practice who have maintained their teeth over a lot of years. And they either have old restorations that are going to fail and we're going to replace it with an indirect restoration, or they have an old amalgam. I still have a lot of patients with huge old amalgams, uh, you know, or old composites. People are going to still break a cusp and they're going to need an indirect restoration. They're still going to have restorations fall out and it's no longer appropriate to do 
a direct restoration, it's time to do an indirect restoration. That's still going to be a thing that we'll do in our practices. And yes, are we going to have patients who say to us, can you do this with a composite? And maybe for the next X number of months, we might say yes. And by the way, I, my, whenever a patient says to me, can't you just one of the things to know is you're being asked to compromise. And if you're gonna say yes, you have to say yes and, and you have to make sure that you fully explain to the patient what that end is. And unfortunately as dentists, we keep that up here in our head. We say yes, and we're thinking about the risks and benefits of this alternate treatment the patient just threw out at us. But if we don't get that out of our mouths, if we don't make sure the patient is fully aware of the fact that they're asking us to do a procedure that has more risks, maybe fewer benefits than the one we originally recommended, then that's a challenge. So we might have to do more yes ends in the next six months, but we're still going to get to do that kind of dentistry, that indirect dentistry. And one of the biggest conversations that I hear, and I know David Hornbrook talked about this a little bit, I was watching um, a couple hours ago, um, is this quandary that we all have about posterior materials. One of the things that um, is interesting about dentistry is we're always looking for what's the material, right? What's the dent adhesive? Just tell me the name of the thing I can buy and I don't have to think about this anymore. You know, what's the thing I'm going to do my posterior restorations. Um, and, I, and I have to tell you, I wish this had happened, but nobody promised me that dentistry was going to get less complex when I graduated from, from dental school. What? Right? What? <laughs> that, that, right? That promise did not come with my diploma. Okay. Um, and dentistry has just actually gotten more and more and more complex over a lot of years. And I don't expect it to get that to change anytime soon. And so people ask me this question all the time. Do you do zirconia or do you do, you do and I'm going to use the brand name Emax. Emax is a brand name for a material called lithium disilicate. And there actually is more than one brand on the market today. When it first came out, Ivaclar had a patent, so we all refer to it as Emax. Right? So do you do zirconia or do you do Emax? That's, I get that question all the time, as if the answer is one or the other. And the answer is yes. I do, do Emax. Emax. Right, yeah, right. I do, I do Emax and I do zirconia. And so the question is really, when do you do those things? Like what are the clinical situations and what are the, um, the thought process? What's the decision tree behind when I would do those things? Because everything in dentistry has risks and benefits. We actually just talked about that. Every treatment plan has risks and benefits. There are no risk-free dental treatments. There are just treatments that have a higher risk profile compared to their, you know, than others. And we try to make recommendations for our patients so that they get the treatment that has the highest benefit profile with the lowest risk profile. So every material has risks and benefits. And so when I think about those two things, um, the, the easy way to say this and what most people would probably tell you is we think of zirconia for strength and we think of Emax or lithium disilicate more for aesthetics. The truth is that playing field has leveled over the last five to six years because um, we have zirconias that are getting more and more and more aesthetic. You know, we're actually probably super close to monolithic zirconia becoming an aesthetic enough material that we can use it in the anterior, even for veneers, as David was talking about. So we do have really aesthetic zirconias today. I would still hold out. I don't think it's quite as pretty as most of the materials in the lithium disilicate family. And we have a much broader selection of aesthetic choices in lithium disilicate. But the other piece of that is as zirconia gets more and more aesthetic, it also gets less and less strong. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to think about those clinical situations, right? So a really general rule about zirconia is the prettier it is, the weaker it is. So if you're gonna use a zirconia material and you wanna do a lower second molar, you probably want the strongest zirconia, 900 to 1400 megapascals. 
because you're probably willing to compromise your aesthetics back on that second molar. And you're doing it because you really want something strong. If you're going to do that same zirconia crown and you're going to do a maxillary first premolar, you probably don't want to compromise your aesthetics. So you're now going to go to an aesthetic zirconia and now you're going to get down to, to strengths that are five to 700. That's right in the same range as lithium disilicate. And if you think the Emax is a prettier material, I might actually do that from a standpoint of Emax. Um, so first thing I would tell people who are listening is if you're not aware of the fact that there's lots of different kinds of zirconia, this is a great time to pick up a telephone, call your laboratory technician. They're also sitting around with less to do, okay? And ask them, what are the varying types of zirconia that your laboratory offers? And how do I let you know on my laboratory prescription which one of those I want, right? It's Mind a great, <laughs> great thing to do in this downtime. Great idea. Call your laboratory guy and say, hey, Let's, I, well, I don't know why I haven't thought of half these things that everyone's coming up with. That, that's Great. brilliant. Yeah, have a conversation. You know, yeah, this we're is, not this supposed is. to think of these things. That's why we get brilliant people like her on here to do the thinking for us. Right. And you can also have this conversation with them because the other part of this when people say, which one of these materials do you do is I would say, which one of these materials does your technician prefer? Which one of these materials does your technician think they're most skilled at? Just like dentists have different skill levels with different materials, so do ceramists. They're not all equally skilled at all of the different techniques and materials. So great to have that conversation and even ask them, honestly. I mean, technicians sometimes know way more about dental materials than most dentists do. And say, what materials do you recommend? Where would you say, you'd say, let's use Emacs or lithium disilicate? Um, and the other material is GCs, it's called Lysi Press, versus where would I use zirconia? You know, because the other piece of this is also that those two materials have different recommendations for how you prep the tooth. And you need to be making sure that before you pick up a handpiece, and this is probably one of the most important conversations around indirect materials, is that before you pick up a handpiece, you need to know what material you're planning to use because you need to prep the tooth to support the longevity of that material. And so I'll give you an example of that. Um, most recommendations for zirconia are that you have an occlusal thickness in the posterior of 0.75 to one millimeter. And again, it depends on the strength of the zirconia you choose. Okay? Emax has two different recommendations. If you're going to bond the restoration, and when I use the terminology bond, I mean, etch the glass, prime the glass, etch the tooth, prime the tooth, apply resin to the tooth, something with a uh, megapascal sedentin over about 19 megapascals. So a true resin-based bonding system. If you're gonna bond Emax, then you can do occlusal thickness of the glass at one millimeter. If you're gonna cement, now you need the occlusal thickness to be 1.5 millimeters. Here's another great question for your laboratory technician. When I send you an impression, virtual or analog, and you all look at how much thickness you have over the occlusal and the opposing tooth, if I wrote Emacs or lithium disilicate on the laboratory prescription, when are you gonna call me to tell me I'm under reduced? By the way, they don't wanna call us. They know that is the least favorite phone call we ever get from our laboratory, okay? And, you know, so they're going to kind of be like Gumby and do gyrations not to call us. Right? Yeah, now speak and, on that because I've heard Mike Detola and all that. That's like the number one problem in between how big of a problem it is. And tell us why. Why is that a huge problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of pieces of this. I mean, number one, what I always tell dentists is instead of being upset that you don't give the lab enough space, you should be proud of that because there's nobody on the planet who can serve tooth structure but dentists. Right. I think that's admirable that we want to take away less tooth structure, not take away more tooth structure. And we have to give the laboratory the appropriate amount of space. And I actually do talk about it not as reduction, but as the appropriate amount of space for the restorative material. And, and it's also really difficult to measure that clinically. It actually is difficult. And what, you know, a lot of dentists do is they, you know, have the patient bite together, they pull their cheek out and they try to eyeball it. Now we're really good at eyeballing tiny, tiny little spaces, but 
it's super hard to see the lingual side of a prep looking at it from the buccal side of the prep. So one of the first things you can do is actually start to measure. The way I do this, if I'm doing analog, is I actually take bite registration, I put it over the prep, I ask the patient to bite and clench, let it set, take it out, and I measure it with a wax caliper. I know exactly how much clearance I have. If you're doing it digital, do a preliminary scan and just go through the couple steps on the software until you get to the occlusal clearance and see what it tells you. Also really precise because it shows you right where to go give a little bit more space. So part of it is we're trying to be conservative. Part of it is it's actually difficult to measure. And then there are other pieces of this and things that we talk about at Essentials One is that as you take away tooth contacts, mandibular position can change. People's condyles can change position. You can lose a little bit of your clearance if you don't understand the occlusion and you aren't managing the occlusion. But now add to it, I send it to the lab and the lab has to pick up a phone and call me if there's not enough space. And they don't want to call me because they know I'm going to be disappointed. And, and by the way, it, it's okay to be disappointed. Get disappointed and then get over it and then figure out what the solution is. But the question to ask them when you do Emacs is when do they call you? So one of the things I try to do on my laboratory prescriptions is I try to write Emacs crown for bonding, Emacs crown for cementation. So if I write for bonding, the lab knows I only need one millimeter of space. They only have to call me when it's at 0.9. If I write for cementation, I'm planning on having a millimeter and a half of space. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So our, well, I, I'm just going to give these questions to you. Our friend Sandra Brand said, um, what resin cement do you recommend to cement lithium disilicate restoration? So, Yeah, and that's a great question. And exactly. So if I said I'm going to cement, they need to call me if it's less than 1.5 and I can bond. But if I am going to cement, and cementation is um, all the SEMs. So when we say resin cement, um, we're typically talking about the SEMs. So Speed SEM plus from Ivoclar, um, Max SEM from Kerr, Unisem from 3M, um, G SEM Link Ace, anything with SEM in the name is a resin based cement. And that is cementation because we never get over 17 megapascals. So you have to have mechanical retention, you have to have resistance form. Um, and now you're going to cement it. Um, so they're all good materials. I hate to make materials recommendations simply because the way I say it is there are no bad materials on the market. Okay. The reason we struggle with materials is, um, we need to read the directions. We need to, or Google the directions. If you don't want to look at a piece where, of paper, where are those? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those, those, all that thousand sheet piece of paper that comes in the box with the material that the first thing we throw away. So really know how to use the specific material that you've bought and get that manufacturer's recommendations because they're not all of the same across different systems um, so that you know how to do that. Um, and I keep lots of different materials in my office. So I cement sometimes with glass ionomer and my actually my all time favorite resin modified glass ionomer right now is from GC. It's a product called Fuji Sem Evolve. They just brought it to market at the ADA last year. I actually told them you can't improve glass ionomer. I was wrong. They did improve glass ionomer. So it's a great new resin modified glass ionomer. Um, and then if I'm going to use a resin based uh, cement or what we call a self adhesive resin based cement. Um, I keep two in my office. I keep Speed Sem Plus from Ivoclar Vivident, and I do keep the GSEM Link Ace from GC America. Um, as soon as I go to actual bonding, so bonding systems, I keep three in my office. Um, I keep uh, Multilink Auto Mix, which I know lots and lots of people hate, but I learned to use it years ago, and um, we hate it. Some people struggle with it because it's technique sensitive. You have to learn how to get to a gel phase. But if you can, it is probably one of the best dual cure resin materials on the market today because of its bond strengths. And then I keep Verilink Aesthetic Light Cure and Dual Cure um, for anterior, posterior, depending on what system I'm doing. So to just cover my bases. Yeah, I am getting, the, the feed's getting blown up. What did she say? <laughs> Write that down. Maybe, maybe you can help us with the, Lee's favorite 
things. Do you, do you have a, you know, you should have, you should create a Pinterest post. These are I have one. I have one. You do? Yes. So if you go to All Pinterest, your, yeah, if you go oh to Pinterest um, and you find me With on dental materials, I have a board that's called my favorite dental products. Oh my God. What is your, on Pinterest, what is your, you, your name? Do you know? Um, it's Lee Ann Brady and Lee Ann is actually two words because Ann is technically my middle name. So it's L-E-E-A-N-N -E -E -N -N Brady, B-R-A-D-Y. And I actually only have like eight or nine boards on Pinterest. Seven of them are about dentistry. And the one you're looking for is called My Favorite Dental Products. And um, and then, of course, I do have one that's red wines I want to try and, Ooh, fiction, I want that. Yeah, and, yeah. and fiction books that people would recommend to me. So if you're into that, you can do those, too. <laughs> you are brilliant. Oh, my gosh. We got. OK, Curtis, I, I want her materials one, the wine one and the books one. I know you <laughs> you are you have some great reads like Curtis, you, you, you were reading. the. Oh, yeah. go ahead. You have to have a Pinterest app. Do you even have that? What is that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a cool word people use. I know my wife loves Pinterest. It's a I'll cool just use her. Word people yeah. use, he says. He can help you. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I am actually gonna. Um, if you're giving, I'm multitasking here because I am gonna put. There's my Pinterest. Well, I just found it too. Okay, Thank so you. there you go. Because somebody asked about it. It actually, you know, it's actually hard to read the chat and talk and like. Yeah. It, this is this is a really good exercise in multitasking when you do Zoom. We got you. We got you. You just chat. We'll we'll you just talk. We'll look at the chat. How's that? <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, so that's what I do. Is any materials that I use in my office and that I lecture about, I pin to that Pinterest board, and I've done that for years actually because remember, I mean, I'm old enough that I remember when we used to give people a printed list of the materials in a course. Mm -hmm. uh, Pinterest is such a phenomenal option for that. And, and here's why I do it. Not only because it's easy for me to update and I don't have to print paper, there's all that greenness. Um, honestly, the reason I do it is because all of the images on my Pinterest actually are links and they're gonna take you back to one of three places. They're either gonna take you to the manufacturer's website so you can get their instructions for use, their technical specifications and all the science information you want about the material. Yeah. Or it may click you back to one of the two independent materials review companies. So it might take you to CR or it might take you to Dental Advisor. And there you can get um, other people's opinions. You know, they send this stuff out to their um, key opinion leaders and there'll be 50 dentists who reviewed the material. So now you're not just getting my opinion. You can get, you know, Gordon and Rella's opinion or you can get Sabia Bunnick's opinion and all of their key opinion leaders. So... That's why I do it on Pinterest because it can tap people into other information too. Yeah, that's a great help this morning. What a great tool. I think, I think you know, if you're a dental professional, watch, like if you have lists of things, because you'll update it once and it's the same link, right? Right. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's more than a PDF that you got to constantly get to people. It's just a living, breathing resource with the links in it. That's genius. Yeah, exactly. So right, it's, I'm yeah, creating it's, an account and I'm following you. If I follow okay, you, there we go. Okay. okay. You can totally don't unfollow me though. I, I like, will not that, or block me. <laughs> I won't. And you know what? I'm actually glad I'm on Pinterest now because now in the next couple of weeks, I actually can search for recipes and crafts and like I have all sorts of time to do things that I haven't, I don't normally have time to do. I don't have to just be a dental geek. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. So, yeah. One more question coming in really quick since we're we're talking about um, material favorites. Um, material of choice for veneers. Um, when I do mean a material, I don't know if they mean a material that they're made out of or a material. To, so I'll give you both. Um, I think the most beautiful anterior ceramic is Empress, IPS Empress. And I still today do a large majority of my ceramic veneers or my all ceramic crowns especially when you're not doing all the teeth and the smile. Single central, I'm going IPS Empress. Two centrals not doing laterals and canines, I'm going IPS Empress. And yes, it's not as strong as Emacs, but I, I collaborate people. I control the anterior guidance. It's still the most gorgeous material because it has the closest light properties to real enamel. That's, if I'm now doing everything in the smile, that's what I, I, may do, the I may do Emacs if, it's a, if I need the high strength. Yeah, because I got, I actually have Empress, except for the ones that have broke. Now they're Emacs. Um, yeah. There's been like three. Uh, yeah. I have 10 and three of them broke. 
So, you know, when things break, there's Might lots of lab. But well, just, no, don't blame the lab. Don't blame the lab. Um, there, when things break, there's lots of conversations to ask. And as the dentist, I first I want to say, how did they break? Right. And breaking is different than debonding. Um, when something falls off the tooth, but it doesn't break. Now you have to look at how you attached it to the tooth and your retention. Where's the cement? If the cement's on the tooth, I didn't bond to the glass. If the cement's on the glass, I didn't bond to the tooth. And if there's cement in both places, the forces overcame the flexural strength of the cement and I need to control force. That's an occlusion question. Um, yeah. You know, if something breaks, then you've overcome the strength of the ceramic. And that to me is always an occlusion question. The first thing I say is not, do I need a stronger material? In my world, the first thing I say is, have I assessed this patient's occlusal risk, functional risk? And if patients are higher functional risk, have I helped manage those risks at all? Have we done a bite split? Have we equilibrated? Um, have I had a conversation with the patient about this? And it's very possible Empress might work and um, we just need to manage the forces. And so, and I will tell you, I'm an example. I have Empress veneers across all of my front teeth and their first set we did 10 years ago, I broke both central incisors in under 24 months. I'm super high functional risk. I grind, I clench, you name it. I do it with my teeth. I'm like the, I am the poster child for it's occlusal cool, right? risk, right? Um, and I do wear a bite splint 100% of the nights that I sleep close, 98%. Nobody's 100%. So you bite, you grind. You're so nice on the outside. What That's high, why. I take it out on my teeth. See? <laughs> but, but we redid them and we redid them again. Um, and Empress is a Lucite reinforced ceramic. Empress is a brand name from Iva Clar Vivident. There's lots of Lucite reinforced ceramics on the market. Um, but we redid mine again, but we stopped and we said, what did we miss about my anterior guidance? Like, and you can miss tiny little subtle things in patients at high risk. And the forces are too great for the veneers. And the replacements have been in, I'm knocking on wood, I don't have any wood, but eight plus years and I haven't broken them. So it's not always a lab. It's not always the material, um, you know, it, and sometimes there are patients where even when you've completely managed the forces, you do need a stronger material. And that's exactly when, for me, my second step would be, I would go to a lithium disilicate, either Emacs or um, Lysine press. Awesome. Well, what's happening here is there is a ton of questions they want you to course. Well, we're going to, we're going to have you back. And, uh, we're going to discuss each one of your Pinterest boards next week. We're going to go through okay. the wine because those <laughs> are the, the wine one. <laughs> we'll do the wine one. Well, no, I'm, we're going to be back. As long as it's time. a taste test wine one. So we get it. Then we taste test together. I, I think, two, I think that's perfect. I have two very important things we need your help with. Number one, you know, there's 2000 people watching this. I want you to tell them, what do you want them to know? And then lastly, I know the Panky Institute's an incredible organization. What kind of a COVID relief program do you guys have for people that just need help and want to sharpen the saw? Absolutely. Um, so I'll do that one. That's an easier question, actually. So we're launching um, free webinars um, starting next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every uh, three times a week. They're at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. They're taught by, uh, everyone is taught by a different person, exceptional members of our visiting faculty um, who you referred to a couple of those when we first started. Um, everything's on social media. So go to the Panky Facebook page, Instagram feed, Twitter, LinkedIn, and you can just register. Um, the registration for the webinars is on our Pankygram website. So pankygram.org backslash webinar. Mm -hmm. And lots of great content and uh, open to everybody, totally open to everybody. And, um, and from a standpoint of even moving forward, um, we're actually um, relaxing some of our uh, deposit requirements and registration requirements around courses to help people so that we can continue to get fantastic CE as we move forward for the rest of the year, even in the face of what we're all going to be managing, which is the economics. Um, I guess I know you had Gary DeWood on the other day, and I think everyone who knows me knows that Gary and I are, are like super best friends and have been for many years. And I actually told him the other day that something he taught me way back when, um, when I was just coming through the Institute as a student is actually what has gotten me through this. And it's a very simple rule, 51% healthcare, 49% business. 
and those numbers don't waver, right? You need to be paying attention to your business, 49%. What, cut, what costs can you cut? Did you turn the air conditioning off at your office before you walked out the other day? I mean, you know, like, like we need to really being, be smart fiscally. And we always have that responsibility. But right now, it's a really big responsibility because we have to be really good business people so that we can take care of our own families, our team members, and our patients. If you're not there in three months, who's going to care for your patients as well as you can, right? You need to do that. But 51% healthcare. I'm always a healthcare professional. That's always got to be what wins in a tug of war is being yeah. a healthcare professional. I love that Garyism. I remember the first time I heard it. I've probably heard 50 times since, but that is, I completely agree. It always rings true. Yep. Always. That should be on a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, you are just the best. Can I ask a favor that you come back either next week, the week? I know the Panky Institute's just an incredible group of people to a great community and you are just a shining example of that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this. And of course I'm happy to come back. So oh. I'd love it. It'd be an honor. The best. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to post all the links. Uh, and uh, my team has watched those links that Lee referred to on the webinars. We're going to post those um, and then uh, sign up for them. And um, let's do this. We're going to take a nine minute break. We're going to come back with another great, incredible leader in dentistry. And Lee, you enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. I will. You guys too. Right, Be well, everyone.